Hey, Carl, do you ever wonder if people debate whether or not you exist? I mean, think about it. They, they never see you. They never hear you. They only ever hear me talking to you. I bet you like half the people out there don't even think you're real. Does Carl exist? Question for the ages. N no, Carl, I don't care if it upsets your mom. You might not exist and she just has to make her peace with that. Does God exist? This is one of the big questions that philosophers debate. In this video, we're going to unpack and critically examine four categories of arguments for the existence of God. But before we do that, we have to take a decent chunk of time to establish some preliminary ideas. First, when philosophers attempt to prove that God exists, what exactly does that mean? Philosophical arguments can take a few different forms. First, arguments can attempt to show that something is impossible. For example, an argument can be offered to show that God can't exist. That is, that God's existence is logically impossible. Some versions of the problem of evil do this, arguing that God, understood as all-powerful, all-knowing, and perfectly good, can't exist because evil exists in the world. In other words, it's logically impossible for that God to coexist with evil. Another form that philosophical arguments can take is to demonstrate that something is possible. Some philosophers will respond to the problem of evil by simply showing that those arguments don't demonstrate that it's impossible for God to exist. All that these arguments are trying to do is demonstrate that it's possible for God to exist. They're not really saying anything about whether it's likely or unlikely, just that it's possible. A third form that arguments can take is to demonstrate that something is probable. In other words, that it's more likely true than untrue, greater than 50%. If someone argues that, given all the evidence available, the existence of God is the best explanation for the world, and the best explanation is the most probable, they're not saying that it's certain that God exists. They're just saying that it's probable probable that God exists. In other words, God's existence is more likely than God's non-existence. We should note that there are degrees of probability. If there's a 51% chance that claim A is true and a 95% chance that claim B is true, both claims are probably true. But claim B is much more probable than claim A. It follows that not all claims that are probable are equally probable. A fourth form arguments can take is essentially the same as the first form, except in the opposite direction. Instead of arguing that something is impossible, philosophers can argue that it is necessary or necessarily true. For example, I might argue that, given other truths we know, a conclusion necessarily follows. If every chinchilla is a mammal, that's a truth, and Gizmo is a chinchilla, he's my pet chinchilla, Aww. then it necessarily follows that Gizmo is a mammal. That's not just probably true, it's necessarily true. In other words, it's not possible that it's not true. To make this as clear as I can, think of it this way. Imagine a jar with 100 marbles in it. You're asked to reach your hand into that jar, pulling out one marble and holding it in your hand with your fist clenched tight so you can't see the marble. You're then asked what color marble you believe you're holding. Now let's imagine a few different scenarios in which this happens. In the first scenario, you know that all of the marbles are blue marbles. Now to the extent that you know there are no red marbles in the jar, and to the extent that you know you are holding one of the marbles from the jar, all of which are blue, you can say two things for certain. First, barring some strange magic, some fluke of nature, or some miracle, it's impossible that you're holding a red marble. Second, again, barring these strange occurrences, it's necessarily true that you're holding a blue marble. In scenario two, all the marbles that you can see in the jar are blue. Now let's imagine that you think, because all the marbles I can see are blue, it's necessarily true that I'm holding a blue marble. But then someone points out to you, just because all the marbles you can see are blue, doesn't mean that all the marbles in the jar are blue. There are marbles you can't see. And it's possible that some of those marbles aren't blue. Maybe some of them are red. You don't know. In that sense, it's possible that you're holding a red marble. In scenario three, you know that more than half of the marbles in the jar are blue. The rest are varied colors. In this case, it's logically appropriate to say, I'm probably holding a blue marble. You might not be holding a blue marble, but you probably are. That's just how statistics work. Now, when we're talking about arguments pertaining to the existence of God, we have to ask ourselves this question. Are the arguments trying to demonstrate that God's existence is impossible, possible, probable, improbable, or necessarily true. Our evaluation of the argument will depend on what the argument is actually trying to demonstrate. By the way, this is true of all arguments. When you're dealing with an argument, you should always ask, is this argument trying to demonstrate impossibility, necessary truth, probability, improbability, 
It's just good practice. Another issue we need to keep in mind is what we mean by the word God. Do we mean something vague and impersonal, like a self-existent force that's responsible for the universe, the god of Spinoza and Einstein? Or do we mean something very specific, like the triune god of Christianity, to whom you can pray and with whom you can have a relationship? Knowing which god we're actually arguing about is really important when we're evaluating arguments. Let's keep all these ideas in mind as we evaluate the following types of arguments about God's existence. Cosmological arguments, teleological arguments, ontological arguments, and arguments from religious experience. First, cosmological arguments. In their most basic sense, cosmological arguments are arguments that attempt to demonstrate God's existence based on the principle of dependence. Let me explain that by looking at two types of cosmological arguments. First, the argument from causation. Everything in the universe appears to have a cause. However, it doesn't seem to make sense to argue that there can be an infinite regression of causation. How can you have an infinite regression of time? So so there must be a first cause, which is itself uncaused. This uncaused cause, or if you want to think in terms of movement rather than causation, this unmoved mover, is what we refer to as God. Second, the argument from contingency. Everything in the universe is contingent upon something else. In other words, everything depends on something else for its initial or ongoing existence. If there's a light, it's always dependent upon a source, such as a flame. If there's a tree, it always came from a seed that came from another tree. It's also dependent upon water and soil and sunlight. But how can everything be contingent? How can everything be dependent? Doesn't there have to be something that isn't contingent? Something that is necessary? Something upon which everything else ultimately depends? This argument says yes, and that something is God. You can find these types of arguments in the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle and in the medieval Christian philosopher Thomas Aquinas. You can also find them in modern day Christian philosophers such as William Lane Craig. Second, teleological arguments. In their most basic sense, teleological arguments see purpose or design in existence. And from this purpose or design, these arguments arrive at the conclusion that there must be an intelligent being providing purpose and design. Again, there are two types of this argument worth exploring here. First, there are classical and modern arguments from intelligent design. Older arguments looked at how well creatures seem to be suited for their particular environments, and argued that those creatures must have been designed for their particular environments. Polar bears in the snow, brown bears in the forest. Newer arguments look at particularly complex aspects of biological life, arguing that such aspects could only arrive if they were designed by an intelligent creator. And of course, this creator is God. Second, another new form of teleological argument is known as the fine-tuning argument. This argument looks at how unlikely it was that the universe would be such that it gives rise to intelligent life. And it turns out that a lot of particular values of the universe, including the cosmological constant, the value of gravity, the values of the weak and strong nuclear forces, have to be pretty darn concise in order for the universe to be conducive to life. If you were rolling dice, the odds would be virtually impossible that this would happen. So, so, the argument goes, the universe must have been designed, finely tuned, to make it conducive for life. And the one who finely tuned it? Well, it's creator. God. Third, ontological arguments. These arguments are unique in that they're a priori arguments. That means they're not based on observation of the world, such as principles of causation or fine-tuning. Rather, they're based on reason alone. Ontological arguments get pretty complicated pretty quickly, and if we trace them from St. Anselm to René Descartes to Alvin Plantinga to other modern forms, it could take a couple videos. Instead, I'm just going to summarize the basic strategy of ontological arguments here. I'll put a couple links in the description if you're interested in diving in a bit deeper. The basic idea of the original ontological argument is that if we can conceive of a completely perfect being, that being must exist. Why? Because existence is an aspect of perfection. In other words, it's better to exist than not to exist. To be or not to be, Carl? Do you be or do you not be? Nobody knows! Not even your mom. Because it's better to exist than not exist, a completely perfect being would necessarily exist. Hence, God must exist. Later versions of the argument are more nuanced, suggesting that a maximally excellent and great God would have all perfections and exist in all possible worlds. Because we can imagine a possible world in which such a being exists, such a being must exist in all possible worlds, including ours. Hence, God exists. Fourth, 
Arguments from religious experience draw on the basic idea that because sensory perception is a relatively reliable way to come to beliefs about the world, religious experience is a relatively reliable way to come to beliefs about the world, because it's based on sensory perception. These arguments often rely on two types of evidence, the accumulative experience of human cultures and particular experiences of human individuals. The accumulative experience argument might suggest that the overwhelming tendency of human cultures throughout history to have a sense of the divine or the sacred provides substantial evidence that God exists. Arguments that focus on individuals could refer to those unique experiences where people encounter God in some unexpected way, perhaps through some miraculous intervention or through some mysterious presence. So, do these arguments prove anything? Well, let's start by noting an important limitation. Almost every argument we've looked at here doesn't get us to a very particular understanding of God, a God that is personal and loving, for example. Even if we're convinced by cosmological arguments, the God that we're talking about here could really just be an impersonal force. If we're convinced by the teleological arguments, God would be intelligent, but that doesn't mean that God cares about us or loves us, or that God is still around sustaining the world. And if we're talking about arguments from religious experience, religious experiences point to so many different versions of God, it would be difficult to say which God, or if really only one God, actually existed. The point is that these arguments don't seem to get us to a particular version of God, certainly not the God of Christianity. Let's take a few moments and consider some weaknesses of these arguments. First, cosmological arguments make some assumptions about space-time and causality that might not be true. For example, causality could operate in a causal loop, that is, causality without beginning. Also, these arguments assume that if there is an uncaused cause, that cause must be God. But it also seems possible that that uncaused cause could be the universe itself, or natural forces, or mathematical principles, something that most of us would not refer to as God. So it's unclear that cosmological arguments get us closer to God. Second, teleological arguments that focus on intelligent design really struggle with Darwinian evolution. It used to make sense to wonder why creatures were so well adapted for their particular environments. Why do white bears live in the snow and brown bears live in the forest? But the basic ideas of Darwin's theory, that creatures adapt over time by means of natural selection, explain why this is the case without the need of a designer. So these arguments don't quite have so much power anymore. What about the arguments from fine-tuning? These arguments do have more strength, but not as much strength as it might seem at first. It does seem unlikely that our universe should have all these particular constants that give rise to life, but if you accept, as many cosmologists do, that we're part of a multiverse, then it doesn't seem quite as unlikely. In fact, it might be statistically inevitable. That is, if there are infinite universes in a multiverse, of course at least one of them is going to have these types of principles that give rise to life. The fact that we are asking this question just means that we happen to exist in that particular universe. And of course, only creatures who existed in that universe would be able to ask those questions. So just as Darwinian evolution challenges the intelligent design argument, the multiverse conception of reality challenges the fine-tuning argument. Third, ontological arguments claim to demonstrate God's existence from reason alone, but they can come off as a bit of word magic, arguing things into existence simply by definition. One wonders if anything that we call perfect, or the greatest possible version of it, has to exist simply because we call it that. Finally, arguments from religious experience are important, but they don't necessarily give us a whole lot to go on. After all, our brains haven't necessarily evolved to give us a glimpse to objective truth. They've evolved to help us successfully navigate our environment so that we can survive. Let me explain. If you're lost in the woods and you know that purple berries are edible for humans, but red berries are poisonous to humans, that knowledge will help you survive. But it would be wrong for you to say that it's objectively true that the purple berries are purple and the red berries are red. The colors that you perceive are simply your brain's way of interpreting interpreting the wavelengths that your eyes receive. And that's based on the physiology of your eyes, the particular sets of cones you have in your eyes. Animals that have different sets of cones that enable them to see a broader spectrum of light waves would see different types of colors. So it's not as if our brains have evolved to tell us what's actually out there. That's not how our brains work. Our brains have evolved to help us successfully navigate our environment so we can survive. That point aside, we can also note that there can be natural explanations for people's religious experiences. In fact, if you manipulate the right part of the brain, you can even get someone to have a religious experience. Heck, psychedelics can do this. No, Carl, don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> also, again, people's religious experiences differ so wildly that it's difficult to know how much trust we can put in them. None of this is to say that these arguments are useless or that religious experience tells us 
us nothing. It's simply to say that these arguments don't get us to the point where we can say that God necessarily exists. The real question, the real debate, is whether or not they can, either individually or collectively, get us to a point where we might say God probably exists, or even less ambitiously, that we can say it's okay for someone to believe in God. It's rational to believe in God. I don't have a definitive answer to this question. I think it's possible for someone to be rational and believe in God. I don't know that these arguments demonstrate that God probably exists, but I don't know that there's definitive evidence that God probably doesn't exist. I think it depends in part on how specifically we define God. At any rate, I hope you found this video helpful in exploring arguments about God's existence. Until next time.